I'm from Platypus, and just briefly, uh, if anyone is interested in Platypus, we hold reading groups, uh, put on events, and publish a paper, some copies of which are available here. Uh, and if anyone is, is, is interested, they should talk to my comrade, Lucy Parker. And we're having a fringe event uh, on uh, a reader <coughs> that we have made from uh, articles published in the Platypus Review uh, tonight after the last session. Uh, I also wanted to, to thank uh, the CPGB uh, for both hosting this session uh, and uh, the entire week. Uh, very uh, gracious reception uh, and, and I've appreciated that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible event. I was mentioning this to Mike. Uh, that you guys managed to put on uh, such a, an extensive uh, debate on the left uh, over so many days uh, in you know with, with you know the small resources that that we small groups on the left have uh, so uh, both my thanks and um, and congratulations on a, on what's so far been very successful certainly one that I've uh, an event that I've enjoyed a great deal uh, I'm going to read. Hopefully, it's not going to be too boring. Uh, but I have a lot I want to say, um, and hopefully, it'll be fairly clear. Uh, I'm talking about Marx's writings uh, today uh, that he wrote uh, in in English and published in the uh, New York Tribune, uh, the, the newspaper for which he worked uh, in the 1850s as an exile uh, here in London. And I'll, I'll talk further about these specific writings and, and their peculiar uh, reception history uh, in the course of my paper. Half a century ago, uh, Michel Foucault proclaimed Marxism exists in 19th century thought as a fish exists in water. This contention is, if anything, truer today than it was then. However, we cannot share the implication that this in itself constitutes a liability for either Marx or the 19th century. For one thing, that century, from that century arises the recognition of the global implications of the rise of bourgeois society and especially its crisis occasioned by industrialization. In Marx and Marxism, that recognition achieved a high degree of consciousness of the, of the historical condition with which we still wrestle at present. This is true even though the specter haunting the present is not communism so much as its defeat the unreconciled legacy of the short 20th century from 1914 to 1989, what Eric Hobsbawm termed the age of extremes. With the outbreak of the imperialist war whose century the world, whose centenary the world observed last year, the great 19th century project that was Marxism entered into crisis. While that crisis was advanced, it was anything but resolved by the Bolshevik revolution which, as a catalyst of world revolution, was stillborn. Once it suffered its first great reverse with the defeat of the Spartacist uprising of 1918 to 1919, the common turn encouraged communists worldwide to recover the revolutionary impetus by helping, helping to foment insurrection in the colonies and semi-colonies. In 1920, this strategic orientation was embodied in the Second Congress of the Comintern's famous theses on the national and colonial questions. If Russia had proven the weakest link among countries with, with a socialist workers' movement, i.e. among the countries taking part directly in the war, state power in China and India might prove still more vulnerable. If in 1905, the question was posed of how to relate to the national revolutionary movements in the East. After 1917, communism linked its fate uh, to these movements. Initially, this was done in a pragmatic revolutionary spirit. 
but as the prospect of revolution faded, that spirit gradually ceased to animate 20th century anti-imperialism. A strategy intended to meet the needs of the hour soon grew into an aim. By the second half of the 20th century, even as the socialist workers' movement collapsed in the land of its birth, in the lands of its birth, rivalries within global communism often took the form of contests to prove who was the colonial people's best ally. By the early 1960s, Franz Fanon famously re-echoed the Bolsheviks' turn towards the anti-colonial struggle, describing it as a stretching of Marxism. Fanon wrote, the third world today faces Europe like a colossal mass whose aim should be to try to resolve the problems which Europe has not been able to find answers. Today we must concede that Fanon's gambit, like the Bolsheviks, has failed. Still, a fateful legacy lingers. 20th century Marxism became intensely, even singularly, preoccupied with imperialism, understood in terms of the colonial question, i.e. as overseas political, economic, and military domination, whether formal, informal, or with the ascendancy of American hegemony post-World War II, neo-imperial. For historians, a major consequence was that 20th century Marxism shaped our understanding of such overseas imperialism more than any other single subject, apart perhaps from European revolutionary history itself. Certainly, as Tony Smith remarked in the early 18, 1980s, while there is no reason whatsoever that the Marxist perspective should define the terms of the study of the international order insofar as relations between early and later industrializing regions are concerned, the fact nevertheless remains that this is the dominant tradition. Despite the attempts of non-Marxist writers to articulate an explanation counter to that proposed by the Marxists, these efforts have remained too sporadic and too unsystematic to engender a consistent counter-explanation of any great dimension, much less a rival tradition of analysis. At this point, Marxism's sole legacy for a rising generation seems to be opposition to imperialism in general and U.S. military intervention in particular, just as post-colonialism is arguably its most tolerant, if ambivalent, legacy in the university. Marx was ill-prepared for 20th century anti-imperialism. His writing pro provides scant basis for any theory of imperialism. As the author of a standard work on Marxist anti-imperialism, Anthony Brewer understands, Regarding anti-imperialism especially, Foucault was right. Marx remains stubbornly fixed in the past. <clears throat> Quote, Marx did not use the word imperialism. That, strictly speaking, is not true, as I'll talk about. Nor is there anything in his work that corresponds at all exactly to the, car to the concepts of, imperialists, of imperialism advanced by later Marxist writers. Robert Young concurs, noting that in relation to liberalism, Marx did not produce any new anti-colonial arguments, unquote. In the same vein, uh, Victor Kiernan states, it would not be easy to extract from Marx's comments on India or other colonial uh, sites a socialist doctrine of imperialism. Clearly, they do not point to the theory of decolonization. Drew Brewer draws the logical corollary. Marxists have not, in general, based their analysis of imperialism on Marx's writings on colonies. For Marxists, this is like much else, this, like much else about Marx, is uncomfortable. However, the question of Marx on imperialism allows for an important investigation of the present's discontinuity with the age of democracy's first emergence. Of course, this is not to say that in the half century of their intellectual activity, Marx and Engels never undertook research into the history of non-Western societies, as well as the relations between what T Tony Smith termed above early and later industrializing regions. They most certainly did. And if we take America, German, and Germany, and Russia to all be Western, and in this sense European, this was in no, in no case more true than with Marx's writings on India. Nor was his engagement wholly confined to comparisons with the industrializing West. Marx's newspaper writings on India of the 1850s, some 60 articles, taken together constitute a substantial body of work 
one that occasioned considerable debate upon their republication in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Those debates were later rekindled on a more expansive textual basis in the 1960s and 70s. Marx's views on India then became bound up with the collapse of Marxism itself. In those years and then and on into post-Marxist trends, such as post-colonialism, Marxism split irremediably along anti-nationalist versus anti-imperialist lines. The former trend was provoked by the Cambodian genocide, the, Iran the Iranian revolution, and the Yugoslavian war to embrace human rights internationalism up to and including cheerleading American military interventions. Anti-imperialists in the same period drifted away from the left's traditional internationalism to the point of risking running ideological interference for the likes of Khomeini, Milosevic, Mugabe, and bin Laden. In this sense, if it is true that the future lies with either Jihad or McWorld, as Benjamin Barber maintains, both are legitimate legatees of the now deceased Marxist left. In recent years, it has become commonplace for post-colonialism to detect in Marx's writings on India some fatal r racial or ethnic bias, some Orientalist or Eurocentric taint. Uh, one of the, uh, somebody just before this session said that we might get shut down uh, for sponsoring a talk on Marxist, Marxist racism since he was a Eurocentric and an Orientalist, according to most students. Um, in this, post-colonialism is true to its own origins in post-war communism, if not to Marx. In the 1970s, criticism on Mark, of Marx on such grounds was a means of critiquing other Marxists, typically Eurocentric, Trotsky, Eurocentric in quote, Trotskyists, Western, or simply Western with a small w, Marxists and Eurocommunists. And Marxists also deployed Marx against anti-imperialism. In his posthumously published Imperialism, Pioneer of Capitalism, Marxist intellectual Bill Warren argued that Marx and Engels considered the role of capitalism in pre-capitalist pre societies progressive, so much so that they welcomed the extension of capitalism into non-European societies, even by force. If this process took a century to complete, however much uh, Warren might quibble with the imperialist methods. With the imperialists methods, he suggests that the process as a whole should be accepted as so much historical debt clearing. Warren substantiated his arguments, Marxist credentials, moreover, by simply quoting Marx's writings on India, the British rule in India, and the future results of British rule in India, in extenso and practically without commentary. Debate respecting such, such arguments was often heated in the 1970s and early 1980s. In the same years during which Warren wrote his Marxist peon to imperialism as the pioneer of capitalism, Edward Said drafted his infamous calumny against Marx. Quote, Marx's writings on India require us to ask whether human sympathy has gone into what realm of thought it has disappeared while or, what, where the oriental vision, Orientalist vision takes its place. Orientalists are neither interested or, nor, in, nor capable of discussing individuals, instead artificial entities, perhaps with their roots in Herderian populism, predominate. There are Orientals, Asiatics, Semites, Muslims, Arabs, Jews, races, mentalities, nations, and the like. Similarly, the age-old distinction between Europe and Asia, or Occident and Orient, herds beneath very wide labels every possible variety of human plurality, re reducing it to the process, uh, in the process to one or two terminal collective abstractions Marx is no exception, unquote. And such arguments were not without warrant from within Marxism. Daniel Thorner had practiced the same sort of analysis, indulging in speculation that assimilated Marx and Engels to romantic racialist currents within 19th century intellectualism. Quote, the reason why Marx took India as his model for the earliest phase of European development is to be sought in the intellectual climate of the years in which he was writing. The relationship then recently discovered between Sanskrit and the Indo-European languages led to the theory that India was the ancestral home of all Indo-European speaking peoples, unquote. 
Marx's India writings thus helped drive erstwhile Marxists out of Marxism, though Warren died too young for this, whether to flirtation with neoconservatism, a la Kanan Makia and Christopher Hitchens, or to anti or post Marxist post colonialisms, a la Said and a host of others. Decades on in the current post post Marxist moment, it is time to cease asking what these writings might mean politically or programmatically, and to ask instead what they meant for Marx in the 19th century. Such an enterprise recommends itself not simply as an exercise in historicism, but in order to ask what they can tell us about our own time when the writing and teaching, not to mention the making of history, seems threatened with loss of purpose and indeed of intelligibility, even as historians claim to rediscover world history. Recovering Marxist thinking on overseas empire would seem worthwhile, uh, not despite, but precisely because Marx and Engels' authorial intentions, embedded as they are in the now remote project of concluding the prehistory of human society, pose problems of a peculiarly, even inveterately, irreconcilable nature. For if Marx and Engels remain indispensable theoreticians of capitalism, they are at the same time not just distant in time, but even more distant in history. This is because of the advanced this is because the advanced bourgeois radicalism they took as their political and intellectual point of departure, and because the socialism that was their fundamental object of critique. It is, in short, because, as Lenin put it, Marx and Engels were Jacobins who wholly associated themselves with the organization of the proletariat. Because, only because Marx and Engels' thought pushed to a crisis, socialism's enlightenment inheritance, were they able to claim both the enlightenment and socialism for themselves. Today, historical circumstances have progressed far beyond, or rather beneath and behind, anything that Marx and Engels and indeed later Marxists would have recognized. Our present is most certainly not the future that the past had in mind. Marx's writings on India help us to provide the language we require to pose a burning question. Where do we now stand in relation to Marx's dialectic? In this sense, in the wake of the collapse of Marxism, Marx's India, India writings may have a new lesson to teach, if only regarding the impediments to historical consciousness in the present. Now I'm going to skip all of the discussion of the textual history of the publication of those writings. Apart from short pamphlets published anonymously in Marx's lifetime, entitled Palmerston and Russia, Palmerston and Poland and Palmerston, What Has He Done?, later edited and published as The Story of the Life of Lord Palmerston by Marx's daughter, Eleanor, after her father's death, together with two other co collections she published, Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Germany, which was, actually, which was actually written from beginning to end by Engels, and the Eastern Question on the Crimean War, Marx's American journalism was largely unknown until the 1930s. In this respect, these writings stand alongside unpublished writings, such as the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts, the German Ideology, and the Grundrisse, in that they form part of what may be termed Marx's 20th century posthumous corpus. Marx has a couple of posthumous corpuses. He has a second international posthumous corpus published by Engels and by his daughters, and then uh, a very large corpus of writings that came out in the 20th century. Unlike those manuscript texts, however, this material is polished, though of course it lacks the sort of conceptual expansiveness characteristic of the young Hegelian engagements or the critique of political economy. The Tribune writings instead form part of Marx's corpus of political essays, whether written for his own publications, the Rheinische Zeitung, the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, or the Neue Rheinische Zeitung Politica, Politische Ekonomische Revue, which was published in London, or for other socialist and democratic papers, such as the People's Paper, uh, the Neue Oder Zeitung, and Die Presse, to name a few. 
The brevity, accessibility, and polemicism of such work does not make it less serious or even less dialectical if that designation be allowed, but it does present interpretive problems of its own. The fact that in the Tribune, India pieces, Marx is simultaneously commenting on British, liberal, and socialist debates, intervening in the American public sphere, battling with the Tribune's editorial line, and finally attempting to critically digest and learn what he can of Indian history and society doesn't make matters any simpler. Even, we, even as we approach Marx's journalism to learn what it meant at the time, this can only be accomplished through a struggle with its 20th century reception. To understand this, we have to recognize that unlike the works that Engels, Eleanor Marx, Karl Kautsky, and others edited and republished in the 19th and early 20th centuries, this material never informed the debates of the Second International. Secondly, unlike much of Marx's 20th century posthumous corpus, the journalism never, was never prominently mobilized against Stalinism. In the long course of its reception, the communist left, both in India and internationally, addressed itself to radically different ends and per pursued widely variant political strategies. The India writings were recruited to the task of legitimizing the often conflicting common turn and post common turn positions prevailing at the time of their publication. Second period Bolshevism, third period ultra leftism, the Popular Front, People's War Line adopted during World War II, through the divisions over how to relate to the ind independent Indian state in the late 18, 1940s. And in addition, as more articles were discovered, a second new left or post-war reception followed in the wake of the Chinese Revolution and later the CPSU's 20th Party Congress, the Sino-Soviet split, and subsequent splits within Indian Maoism. In short, from the beginning, these writings were recruited to disparate and ultimately opposed, even contradictory, pragmatic, programmatic agendas and intra-communist disputes. The 70s debates already mentioned represent the final stage in a long-standing argument over revolutionary strategy within 20th century communism. Post-colonialism transmits the prolonged crisis of Marxism down to university students in the present, albeit with very little self-consciousness. Marx is not peculiar in failing to elaborate an anti-imperialist politics. The socialists of the first and the parties of the second international similarly advanced nothing that the 20th century could recognize as anti-imperialist politics. Deploring and at their best critically grasping imperialist chauvinism, racism, and the enormities that invariably accompanied them, Marxists and other socialists within the Second International typically regarded European overseas empires during the period of 1889 to 1914 as bastions of the state power that they sought to overthrow. What the leading theoretician of imperialism prior to 1914 Karl Kautsky termed the exploitation colonies, existed for them in much the same way that they did for increasingly dismayed liberals, namely as sites where the authoritarianism and militarism of European states and the economic arrangements they imposed were on flagrant display, as for instance in the recurring famines in India, the notorious brutalities practiced in the Belgian Congo, the Spanish-American War and the forcible suppression of the Philippine Republic, and the brutalities and contradictions of the Boer War. Still, socialists, and much less Marxists, had no comrades amongst the colonized, and certainly none with any base amongst organized workers. This was because in the colonies and semi-colonies, like China and India, there was no organized working class, and only the barest rudiments of democratic politics. No less than the capitalist economy, democracy itself was Eurocentric. To criticize Marx and revolutionary Marxists of this period, then on grounds of Eurocentrism, is to criticize them for attempting to realize the potential of, cap of capitalism and democracy, for being unwilling to put off the social revolution until non-Western countries industrialized, something that, of course, has taken place only very unevenly up to the present day.
In the second half of the 19th century, there were a number of national questions, most notably in Marx and Engels' day, the Irish, Polish, German, and Italian questions. But there was no colonial question, and certainly none viewed as a subspecies of the national question, especially not as regards the exploitation colonies. International socialism's attitude was clear. The scramble for and rival, rivalry over them was the offspring of the same economic situation which has increasingly transformed capitalism from a means of developing the greatest productivity of labor into a means of limiting this development, unquote. That's, that's I believe, Kautsky in 1907. The post-liberal imperialist project, in other words, was inextricably bound up for, for Kautsky as it had been for Marx, though even more so, with the rise from competitive markets themselves of monopolies and cartels and the resultant erosion of competitive capitalism, the accompanying proliferation of protectionist and nationalistic economics, public authoritarianism, and the militarization of society. Advocacy of a socialist imperial policy, inevitably parroting liberal imperialist aspirations, emerged within socialist, even Marxist circles, but was rejected, at least in theory, as a step towards revisionism, i.e. of the abandonment of Marxism. The Russian Revolution of 1905 found resonances in Turkey, Persia, China, as well as India, giving the debates of the 1907 International Socialist Conference in Stuttgart a new salience. Lenin was particularly attuned to the emergence of the colonial question. Thus, on the occasion of Balgan Gadar Tillich's conviction by the Bombay High Court on charges of sedition in June 1908, the workers of the Bombay textile mills struck work and a hartal was observed sporadically across the city for weeks. Declaring the sentence pronounced by the British jackals on the Indian Democrat Tillich to be infamous, Lenin famously heralded the strike actions and demonstrations saying, the class-conscious European worker now has comrades in Asia, and prophesied that their number will grow by leaps and bounds. The modern philosophy of history, and with it the possibility of modern historical knowledge, was first elaborated in the late 17th century and reached a critical depth and self-awareness in Marx and Engels' acknowledged forebearers, above all Rousseau, Smith, Diderot, Kant, and Hegel. As philosophes of a second enlightenment, Marx and Engels reconsidered this philosophy of history, not by opposing it, but in light of the self-contradiction into which bourgeois freedom had fallen in the 19th century. The Second International acknowledged this continuity in the revolution when it chose the 100th anniversary of the great French Revolution as the occasion for its founding in Paris in 1889. The original philosophe, as self-conscious thinkers of a new historical circumstance, argued that the emergence of freedom in Europe was of universal significance, even when and for peoples who had not yet encountered Europe and were as yet utterly unaware of the collapse of traditional society there. The question of constituting history as the history of freedom was for them a universal project before it became global. Indeed, as Rousseau and Diderot made clear in their writings on the noble savage and the Tahitians, etc., the very globalization of commercial society, particularly its encounters with uncivilized and thus in their own way free peoples, demanded that the modern project of freedom be radically advanced. Though they hoped and struggled for what might be termed revolutionary cosmopolitanism, still, they would not have disagreed with what one post-colonialist main, uh, maintains when he says that history's success as a hegemonic knowledge form depended on the destruction of societies that made some human community's history poor to begin with. Humanity and its history from the first dawn of freedom in natural history through the at best ambivalent experience of civilization to the fraught social life of commercial society became present to consciousness as the sense of the historicity of experience precisely because freedom's further realization 
demanded historical consciousness. Out of resistance to impediments to its own development, liberal society could elaborate its own open-ended capacities, generating a <coughs> process of enlightenment only through exercise of public reason, and in that way, as Kant argued, must gradually ascend to the thrones and the influence of, to influence the principles of government. As in the thought of Marx and Engels, the original Enlightenment vision always found concrete application as bourgeois society spread, nowhere more so than in the case of India. For instance, after the Battle of Plassey that inaugurated the East India Company's transformation into a powerful state in India, Adam Smith demanded that the rule of law replace the company despotism that he recognized threatened the very constitution of the British Empire. This would allow for greater interpenetration of Indo-British capital, and, would, and this in turn would serve as a means for fostering the growth and extension of an Indian popular movement in favor of wage labor. At the same time, by expanding British manufacturers and putting more wage laborers to work in Britain, Britain would be enabled to export more of the commodity that above all symbolized the revolution of the commodity form of labor, silver, to be coined into rupees and exchanged by the Indian worker with his butcher, grocer, vegetable seller, and toddy seller. Smith's revolutionary imperialism, in other words, sought deliberately to constitute the British Empire as what it aspired to become, perhaps at no time more fully realized than in the Seven Years' War, the sword arm of an expansive bourgeois revolution countering the aspirations of absolutism. The form of sociality that took the place of the old society of estates was grounded in the prospect of the generalization of wage labor, a process that Smith's political economy was committed to deepening and extending as far as commercial society might reach, a society in which men and women could take responsibility for themselves, in which they had no longer to beg their superiors, literally or figuratively, for a living. And this, and precisely this, was what Adam Smith called civilization. In other words, if indeed the, revolution, the resolution of the class question passes through the caste question, to put it in Indian terms. This was a bourgeois revolutionary project. Even if under capital, that project reaches beyond itself to call into question bourgeois conditions themselves. Like Rousseau, Smith viewed the entire history of civilization since the collapse of communal property as so many forms of human self-enslavement that he hoped commercial society might forever put an end to. In his first full-length piece on India, Marx literally exudes this bourgeois scorn for rural slavery and, and from which the city-dwelling free man had in Europe only recently escaped. Quote, we must not forget that these idyllic village communities, he's talking about Indian villages, inoffensive though they may appear, restrained the human mind within the smallest possible compass, making it the unresisting tool of superstition, enslaving it beneath traditional rules, depriving it of all grandeur and historical energies. We must not forget the barbarian egotism which quietly witnessed the ruin of empires, the perpetration of unspeakable cruelties, the massacres of populations of large towns, with no other consideration bestowed upon these events than on natural events. We must not forget that this undignified, stagnatory, and vegetative life, these little communities were contaminated by distinctions of caste and by slavery, and that they subjugated man to external circumstances instead of elevating man, the sovereign of circumstances. They into the sovereign of circumstances, that they transformed a self-developing social state into an ever-changing natural destiny. Marx's was a bourgeois radical inheritance, one, as he repeats, we must not forget. <clears throat> Here was no innocent liberal theory according to which modernity will somehow see to the withering away of caste. Rather, for Marx, as for the Enlightenment, the history of all preceding epochs were fundamentally characterized by slavery and arbitrary power, and in a way that was not true, at least not in the same way, of uncivilized peoples who were too backward to enslave themselves. <laughs>
In the two most famous of all the articles Marx wrote for the Tribune, the British rule in India and the future results of the British rule in India, Marx re-elaborates re a core concern of the manifesto, the inadequacy of capitalism to the, to the project of world society inaugurated in the bourgeois epoch. His articulation cuts straight to the question of what divides his time from that of the Enlightenment. Marx begins much in the vein of Enlightenment critics of the East India Company, noting that its rule was in many ways worse than the despotism it supplanted. Quote, European despotism planted upon Asian despotism by the East India Company forms a more monstrous combination than any of the divine monsters staring at us in the cave temples near Bombay. Adam Smith would not have disagreed, but this, Marx explicitly notes, is not what makes the misery inflicted by the British on Hindustan of an essentially different and infinitely more intensive kind than all Hindustan had to suffer before. To understand what is distinctive about what Marx calls the present misery of the Hindu, an account of the exploitation perpetrated by monopolists, oligarchs, and aristocrats is not enough. It represents an altogether new and fateful crisis of freedom, one distinct from the unfreedom of the early colonial period, as well as the pre-bourgeois past. According to Marx, what had transformed the India question by 1853 was the Industrial Revolution. Its impact reached into the very structure of the traditional Indian division of labor and the relations between city and countryside in all their variety in different, different regional contexts. Pointing to Indians, India's ancient renown as a producer of textiles, Marx writes, since remotest antiquity until the first decennium of the 19th century, spinners and weavers were the pivots of the structure of Indian society. Herein lies the great change, one utterly unforeseen by the likes of Adam Smith, who anticipated, given the abolition of the company's trade monopoly, a pattern of free trade with India that would be characterized by the exchange of specie for Indian manufacturers. It was the British intruder, Marx writes, that in the 19th century broke with the tradition of all past invaders of India, whether benign or despotic, because it was the British who broke up the hand loom and destroyed the spinning wheel. England began driving the Indian cottons from the European market and then it introduced industrial, industrially produced twist yarn into Hindustan and in, the in, in, and in the end inundated the very mother country of cotton with cotton. British steam and science uprooted over the whole surface of Hindustan the union of agriculture with manufacturing industry. It was not simply the brutal interference of the British tax gatherer or the British soldier, but the massive importation of industrially produced goods that was salient for Marx. As Marx and Engels had written in the manifesto, by the rapid improvement of all instruments of production, by the immensely facilitated means of communication, capital draw, draws even the most barbarian nations into civilization. In other words, the same process then operating in Latin America and on the Chinese seaboard was then producing in India, quote, the greatest, to speak the truth, the only social revolution, social revolution ever heard of, unquote. The corrosion of Indian pre-capitalist social relations was not the result of the sort of revolutionary imperialism that the philosophes envisioned or felt could be possible. Of course, Marx agreed with them that England, in causing a social revolution in Hindustan, was actuated only by the vilest interests and was stupid in, their manner, in her manner of enforcing them, unquote. But the essential narrowness of the East India Company's purposes, familiar enough to the likes of Smith and Diderot, was not responsible for the most drastic transformations occasioned under British rule. Indeed, it was not imperialism alone that carried out that revolution, however much it aggregated, aggravated its effects. When the renewal of the company's charter was in debate, in short, Marx takes up arguments of Smith's liberal heirs, people like John Bright and Richard Cobden and others, while at the same time he emphasizes that it was free trade, which he nevertheless supported, and not the corrupt and unaccountable company that was causing the deepest upheaval in Indian society. <clears throat> 
And for this, of course, as Marx underscored, the liberals had no remedy. The destruction of the pre-existing social order in India advanced steadily with the growing exportation of industrial products into the country. At the same time, even as capitalism spread, bourgeois social relations disintegrated. The question was for Marx, the same as it was for Smith, can mankind fulfill its destiny without a fundamental revolution in the social state of Asia? The bourgeois revolution had constituted a possibility for what Marx termed the future results of British rule in India, the new, a new world, one in which universal intercourse founded upon mutual dependency of mankind was built upon the development of the productive powers of man and the transformation of material production into a scientific domination of natural agencies. Yet modern freedom had entered into contradiction with itself under issuing, ushering in a new period that could no longer be understood or advanced in the old way, even as the old his, world historical task remained unfulfilled. How am I doing for time? Marx and Engels' attitudes towards the colonized world did not, in short, stem from indifference, much less chauvinism as the Eurocentrist charge maintains, but from the realization that the horror and cruelty of a specifically <coughs> capitalist imperialism could not be fully addressed apart from the revolutionary political strategy to which they were, of course, dedicated. Egalitarian sentiment did not dictate revolutionary strategy. That, for Marx and Engels, necessarily focused on the self-organized working classes in Europe, which was, which were, should be remembered, by no means the worst suffering classes in European society. If the colonized themselves were in no position to advance politically independent of imperial politics, they might do so in opposition to the imperial state, up to and including dealing it a definitive military defeat. As for the empire itself, the best it could do was to facilitate capitalism's liquidation of pre-capitalist social relations. As Marx wrote, all the English bourgeoisie may be forced to do will neither emancipate nor materially mend the social condition of the mass of the people, depending not only on the development of the productive powers, but on their appropriation by the people. But what they will not fail to do is to lay down the material premise for both. Has the bourgeoisie ever done more? Has it ever affected progress without dragging individuals and peoples through dirt and blood, through misery and degradation? The terrible human suffering entailed by the perpetuation of capitalism was not, Marx recognized, confined to workers or even to those living in Europe and North America. But neither was the suffering of the colonies simply a function of the inevitable social strain deriving from the modernization of a pre-capitalist social order. Bourgeois society had brought about not the end of history in the sense of mankind's long record of self-enslavement, but a society in which wage labor had become, if not slavery, a self-undermining form of social freedom. Yet this circumstance, the self-contradictory commodity form of labor, itself created the possibility of a transition to a new form of society. As Marx remarked in The Future Results of British Rule in India, when a great social revolution will have mastered the results of the bourgeois epoch, the market of the world, and the modern powers of production, and, subjug and subjected them to the common control of the most advanced peoples, then only with, will human progress cease to resemble that hideous pagan idol who would not drink nectar but from the skulls of the slain. This new form of society would transcend, in the words of the manifesto, both caste, that complicated arrangement of society into various orders, Stande, that manifold gradation of social rank, Gesellschaftlichen Stellungen, and its bourgeois supersession, class, or Klasse. Adorno grasps this lingering enlightenment aspiration of the manifesto elaborating it as a critique of 10,000 years of human civilization. The concept of class is bound up with the emergence of the proletariat. By extending it 
theory denounces not just the bourgeois, it also turns against prehistory, the history of class society itself. It destroys the illusion of a good-natured patriarchy that had been assumed by prehistory following the victory of an inexorable capitalist calculation. The venerable unity of traditional society, the natural right of hierarchy in a society, presented as having grown organically, turned out to be a unity of interested parties. That hierarchy had always been a coercive organization designed for the, expro expro for the appropriation of the labor of others." Unquote. Modernity arose out of the crisis of feudalism and the consequent flight of serf, uh, and the consequent flight from serfdom. At its birth, it announced the overcoming of caste. But even that foundational promise has been caught in the progress re regress dynamics of freedom self contradiction under capital. As Adorno remarks, the archaic silence of pyramids and ruins becomes conscious of itself in materialist thought. It is the echo of factory noise in the landscape of the immutable. I'm almost done. Now, in 1857-58, the British in India made a mockery of the law of nations, foreshadowing the extreme brutality and political mendacity that would come to characterize the entire colonial experience by a century's end. Speaking of the suppression of the 1857 Indian Revolt, Marx wrote, the English, whether the officers and soldiers actually engaged in India in the suppression of the rebellion, or the English public at home, have not appeared disposed to make the slightest discrimination between the offense of murder and mere hostility proved or suspected to English domination. Instructions enforcing this legal distinction found very little response in the public sentiment, either of the English in India or the English at home. In fact, they provoked a perfect howl of indignation. And it doesn't appear that down to this time they've had the slightest effect on the actual conduct of the war. He's talking about the suppression of the Indian mutiny. If war that can be properly called, which so far as the Indian soldiers are concerned, concerned seems rather to have the character of wholesale slaughter and military execution. Wherever a detachment of English troops appears, a bloody assize, it seems, is held, one village being laid waste after another, and the headmen hung in cold blood on the sole ground that they had set aside their allegiance. That the halter disposes of all who escape death on the battlefield appears from the significant fact that after a war with a numerous enemy carried on for ten months, the British are not in possession of a single prisoner." Unquote. No band of drunken louts in the service of European counter-revolution or czarist pogrom could outdo such civilized barbarity, as Marx called it. Marx portrays British colonialism in these writings as an, ex as an, in, as an extreme example of the rot that had come to permeate bourgeois society in the context of its political overripeness for socialism. Life and property, property were never so insecure as they were when the Raj was reimposed across North India. Commenting on the newspaper accounts, or rather celebrations, of the looting by British soldiers, English, Ingalls remarks, the calm accords of Genghis Khan and Tamerlane falling upon a city like a swarm of locusts and devouring everything that came in their way must have been a blessing to a country compared with the eruption of these Christian, civilized, chivalrous, and gentle British soldiers. The former at least soon passed away on their erratic course, but these methodic Englishmen bring along with them their prize agents who convert loot into a system, who register the plunder, sell it by auction, and keep a sharp lookout that British heroism is not defrauded of a tittle of its reward. Ingalls writes well. As Marx had not failed to observe, public opinion as represented in the English press supported the bloody assizes taking place thousands of miles away. As Ingalls marvels that the, that the Times seems seemingly neutral, though 
runs seemingly neutral the picturesque accounts of plunder on a grand scale. Such remarks are necessarily unsystematic, but it is in the telling detail that Marx hopes through journalism to capture the corrosion of liberalism. To the extent that the revolt of 1857 sought to restore the Mughal Empire, Marx registers a fundamental question. How would colonial people respond to migration into capitalist society under the auspices of the Bonapartist state? The question, in other words, for Marx, is not one of supporting or opposing the Sepoys project, but of reading the Sepoys' attempt to restore the past as a symptom of the crisis of liberalism on a world scale. I'll leave it there. You shouldn't misunderstand me. Uh, I am, I'm talking about Marx, and I'm talking about the 19th century, and the point is to illuminate Marxism. I mean, with all due respect, I'm a historian of India. I, I understand what you, Ted, are talking about as well, but I wasn't giving a paper about the history of India. Right? I'm really trying to illuminate Marx's thought. And the, the point is not that by, because Marx didn't have a theory of imperialism that he supported it. It's not what I'm saying at all. I think the quotes that I read out um, you know, make it very clear that Marx is a scathing critic um, of the British Empire in India. And of course, um, not only are the people of Asia in the 19th century not the same, we're not the same either. Uh, obviously, immense historical changes have taken place and the you know, I'm not making an argument or I'm not trying to adjudicate a question about, you know, the social nature of modern Indian society. Is it semi-feudal or is it fully capitalist? All of those debates are not within the frame of this paper. As I mentioned, Marx actually does use the word imperialism. He uses it as a synonym for Bonapartism. The empire in question is that of the of Louis Bonaparte. That's you go search on Marxist.org. Excuse my language. Uh, if you go search on Marxist.org, what you'll find is the use of the word imperialism in the 18th Brumaire and the Civil War in France where he's talking about the collapse of bourgeois norms of the state and a new state form arising out of a contradictory social formation, out of capitalism. He's talking about the distinctive character of the state under capitalism and why it requires the dictatorship of the proletariat for its overthrow. Right? That's what he's talking about when he's talking about imperialism. He's talking about it as a product of society in open contradiction, i.e. in societies in which there have been socialist revolutions that have failed, i.e. above all England and, Britain and France, uh, the failure of Chartism and especially the failure of the revolution of 1848. That's what he's talking about. The discussion, this is why I brought the, the discussion around to what I think is Marx's major preoccupation, which is the news coverage of what's happening in India and the suppression of the Taiping Rebellion, where he's saying, look, the people of Britain, you know, and I don't mean the people of Britain, but you know, the, the mob to which the, the, the Times is addressing itself. Right, the Tory mouthpiece of the times of the day, which is the paper he likes to skewer most often. Right? The petty bourgeoisie of England and, of course, the unemployed mob right, that the, Tory, the Tories are making an appeal to. Right? What they do is they stoke chauvinism, jingoism, 
and militarism in the population, right? They are, it's expressive of the crisis of liberal society for Marx. It's expressive of the, the nature of a society in which the bourgeoisie can no longer rule and the proletariat cannot yet rule, as Marx puts it. The condition of Bonapartism. So, it's, and Yasmin, you know, what I was saying is that, you know, it is not that, I mean, I think the more important point, I agree with everything that you say, I don't, I, you know, I, I'm no defender of, of Western intervention against the jihadis or, you know, preemptive strikes on the Iranian nuclear program or anything else. Right? But what I was trying to point out is that we should attend to the fact that the question of imperialism was central to the collapse of the left, which is the more important issue that we have to face, in my mind. Right? That, yes, there were some people like Bill Warren who are basically the precursors of Kanan Makia and Christopher Hitchens. You can call them renegades, whatever you want to say. They came out of recognizable leftist formations in this country, in the United States. Their arguments were viewed as leftist arguments in the 60s and 70s. Yes, they tend in a particular direction that they, they become State Department socialists and more mongers and the rest. But the same thing happens with the nationalist domination of anti-imperialist arguments, right? I went to anti-war uh, protests in the city of London, right, in which the slogan was raised, we are Hamas. Now, that may not be everybody, but that's a sign of the historical context we're in. And I'm using the question of anti-imperialism, as I said explicitly from the out, outset, not to make programmatic, not to draw programmatic conclusions from Marx. I'm not suggesting what anybody's line should be. What I'm saying is that the more fundamental issue is to face the depth of the crisis that we're in. And the depth of the crisis is real, right? The, we face a real problem in being anti-imperialists in a context where we have no leftist comrades in Afghanistan and Iraq and very few in Iran. You know, where we can't say we're in solidarity with this party or this social formation that struggled for decades to overthrow the dictator. Right? We can't say those things because of a real social crisis. And it has ideological effects. And that's all that I was trying to say. Now, you know, if, you know, I can repeat the programmatic line that, you know, any, any programmatic line that you want me to on the, you know, the nature of American imperialism today, but that doesn't really get to the epochal issues that I was trying to raise. There was a national question in the 19th century with respect to Ireland. I said clearly that it was not a colonial question uh, any more than any of the other national. I mean, you could talk about great Russian imperialism with respect to Poland, but that's not what we mean when we talk about a colonial question in the 20th century. And indeed, the Bolsheviks understood when they were talking about the colonial question, they were talking about something new. What was new is they were talking about the development of organized working classes that lacked socialist leadership in 1920. Now, it, it's true that in the Bombay strikes that Ted brought up, there was the formation of a Communist Party in Bombay uh, in India. Uh, whether you view that as a Stalinized party or not, I'm not here to debate. But prior to that, all leadership of the organized working class was precisely of the sorts of lawyers and well-meaning uh, newspaper editors and people like Balgan Gadar Tillich, who was mentioned by Lenin, who I did address, 
as specifically heralding the emergence of the working class in India in 1908, and who I pointed out was very keenly aware of these developments. Now, I made it ex if I didn't make it clear to you that the Roman Empire and the empire in the age of industrialization are not the same, then I surely failed in this talk. My point is to show that not only is 19th century industrialization not the same at, in any meaningful sense with pre-capitalist imperialism, it's not the same as, and this addresses, begins to address Mike, it's not the same as slave plantations with Venice and Genoa in the early period, it's not the same as the West Indies. Why? Not because I believe in a liberal fantasy that describes those empires. That liberal fantasy would have nothing to do with some of the examples Mike addresses because it was very clear to all the liberals that Portugal in the 16th century and Spain in the 16th century New World were utterly illiberal and had nothing to do with with modern revolution. But even with respect to the Dutch and the English in the 17th and 18th century, liberals were not Pollyanna. They didn't have a notion that the, the world is wonderful and wage labor is just going to spread on its own and we can rely on history to take care of it. They were revolutionaries. And in fact, when slaves revolted in Saint-Domingue, many of the French revolutionaries heralded their struggle. It's not that they were indifferent to slavery or that they couldn't bear the thought of slaves rising up and killing their white masters. By no means. The point is, what was the horizon of emancipation? The horizon of emancipation, it, the, and there's a reason why liberals developed an anti-slavery campaign, and they didn't have to wait for the socialists. Because liberalism had a critique of slavery in the name of wage labor. That's the point. They had a critique of the brutality of the empires. It's not to say they were describing those empires. And that critique led society as a whole. It spoke for the aspirations of society as a whole. It didn't speak to the aspirations of the bourgeoisie. It spoke to the aspirations of the peasants or the people who had come into the cities whose parents and grandparents had been serfs and slaves, who were enjoying the freedom of modern society and wanted to see the rule of law extended, wanted to see the labor contracts enforced, wanted to see feudal prerogatives liquidated. That's the point of talking about bourgeois revolution. Now, with industrial society, Jerry, that ceases to be a, 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 a viable program. Why? Because capitalism doesn't spread in the same way. <coughs> the cities that emerge in India and in Brazil and China are massive slum megalopolises in the 20th century. They are not societies of labor. They are, in, even in revolutionary China, they can't end peasant production. They can't draw the people off the land and into the cities. We live in a society in which labor is scarce. Wage labor is extremely scarce. And such as exists is near slavery such as in Bangladesh, where we see these factories burned down, where people are earning less than a dollar an hour, right? The, there is a crisis of the commodity form of labor that didn't exist for Adam Smith. And this is the point, Mike. It's not that there were never any examples of this form of relative surplus value extraction. And whatever example you give, Marx's point is that in the 1840s, unemployment and the crisis of labor becomes a conscious reality for the people. 
it becomes so generalized across every sector that productivity is rising and will continue to rise inevitably. Not just that there was a one-time productivity increase in this or that sector, but that the Industrial Revolution exists and is ongoing. And that the growing powers of mankind over natural scarcity are experienced by mankind as a catastrophe. Because we experience our growing power of science and technology as unemployment. Right? That's the point in the 19th century. It's that already anticipates the You may say so, but I'm glad that you did say that that's not Marx. That's not Marx. It's not Marx. I agree. It's wow. not Marx, and I agree with Marx. Because why? Because it's not there in Elizabethan England because the people aren't conscious of it. It's a problem because there's socialism. Statute of Artificers. Yeah, but the point is, is that socialism comes to be in Marx's lifetime. And Marx is a theorist and indeed a critic of his time. He's not just making a theory about how things developed. He's, he's, a net, he's analyzing socialism as the preeminent symptom of his time. That the, the realization of the general will of society can only be advanced by a single class, which had never been the case before. And that's the problem that Marx is trying to analyze. For Marx, if you'll notice, the socialist worker's struggle is a part of capitalism. That's why it can't be in Elizabethan England or in 1700. The socialist worker's struggle is an integral moment driving industrial production. Because as he puts it in capital, it puts a limit to the extraction of absolute surplus value by declaring a limit on the working day. And therefore, the struggle with capital has become integral to democracy. And that's Marx's problem. You know, what you're talking about is, it, it, it may be, better history than Marx, but it's got nothing to do with Karl Marx.